Yeah, welcome everyone um, to New Things We Love and More Things We Want in CSS. Uh, we are a couple awesome front-end developers from Lullabot um, who are here to blow your mind about some CSS stuff. So hopefully you're here at the right place. Not to oversell it. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, Aubrey Sambor. I am a senior front-end developer. I'm Adam Barr. I'm a front-end, just regular front-end developer. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this is a slide with more about us. Um, you see, I've been working. If this is, is this big enough, or should I make it bigger? <coughs> okay. So I've been working with HTML and CSS for about probably over 20 years at this point. Um, I learned, I got into CSS when I wanted to remove underlines from my links, which is something you should not do now. But 18-year-old self like wanted to everything to look really nice and pretty. Um, I've been with Drupal since 2009. Um, I love accessibility. I love CSS, obviously. And I live in Western Massachusetts, so it's way, way warmer here than it is at home. So that's really nice. Oh. Yeah, you have to, you have to talk. Yeah. Uh, I'm Adam Varn. I'm a front end developer at Lullabot. I've uh, been working in Drupal since 2009, um, and I've been a long time uh, for Drupal Camp. I was, used to be hot sauce design development because I worked for myself for about 11 years. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to join Lullabot um, full time. I also do a lot of accessibility and like playing around with CSS and code pens and things like that. Um, I live two hours west of here in Tampa, um, and I'm a co-organizer of Floor Drupal Camp with Amy June, Heinlein, and um, Mike Herschel. And I've missed, I've attended every Floor Drupal Camp except for two, the very, very first one, and the one the year my daughter was born, because my, she was two months old, my wife's like, you're not going. I was like, all right, fair. <laughs> fair. <laughs> um, and you can follow us on Mastodon. We both have kind of sworn off the evil bird site now, yep. so um, we'll have our postings on the slide, on the um, slides we post on the website if you want to follow us and say hi. There is a, just a quick plug for Mastodon. There's a Drupal community Mastodon, so if you're interested in joining Mastodon, checking it out, drupal.community, you can join all the cool Drupal people there. So, anyway. Yep. All right, <clears throat> so we're here to talk about some new CSS. Um, so these are some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, we're gonna go over container queries, we're gonna go over an oldie but goodie, not, um, mm -hmm. has, is where, line clamp, the layers, and CSS logical properties. Um, has is still not supported in Firefox yet. We're very really, soon, very yes. Soon. Hopefully, hopefully, like within the next like couple months, that will finally be supported, so you can use all the goodness that I'm going to talk about with has. Um, and also, this is major browsers meaning not IE11. Yeah, everything else, yeah. everything else is supported except for IE11. Because who cares about IE11? Anymore, yeah. Unless you have to. <laughs> yeah, I have to still. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of bummer. Anyway. Um, and also we're going to talk about more things we want. Um, these are things that are maybe supported in a couple browsers, but not all of them, or things that are in like spec, like there's like, what, W3C specs or yeah. stuff like that yeah. for them. So all these ones will also be really cool. Um, I don't think we're going to talk about container style. I think that's one that we might touch on when we're going over like container queries, but um, that one we're not going to talk a lot about, I don't think. We made like a million edits to that and I just realized we left that in there without my yep, mistakes. Exactly. So, yeah. Yep. So what happens. All right. So we're going to start off with uh, logical properties. Yes. So. so CSS logical properties or directions. We don't need no stinking directions. Um, so CSS logical properties have been around since, supported since roughly 2017 um, in every browser. So what it does is instead of doing padding left, padding right, margin top, margin bottom, you replace the, le the directionals with um, block or inline. So if it's a vertical, it would be padding block start for padding left. If it's, if it's um, you know, a margin, it would be padding inline end for margin right. Um, and it applies to sizing, margins, padding. Floats is only supported right now in Firefox um, for some reason. And then positioning and border. So like position like top, bottom, left, right. Um, and it's useful basically for direction and for writing mode if you're dealing with sites that have multiple languages like RTL languages, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, to give some kind of examples, hopefully everybody can see this. So this is like, the logical properties work the exact same way as the regular properties that you might be familiar with. So top becomes inset block start, width becomes width, or width becomes inline size, height becomes block size, and then max width would be max inline size, max block size. So Inline is, is horizontal, block is vertical. Um, and this is kind of just, I won't go through every single one, but you're basically replacing, um, yeah, you're basically making the, replacing the, the directional orientation with block or inline for depending on what the situation is. So if you wanted to do the bottom, we'd padding block end. If you wanted to do the right side, it'd be 
having inline end, and then left would be left is start, right is end, bottom is end, top is start. Not confusing at all. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's one of these things where it takes a little bit to get used to it, but once you start do, writing things this way, it becomes a lot more, um, a lot easier to remember. So why do they? Why do the properties matter? So for languages <laughs> other than English, it's very important to have. Um, to have that directional thing, because if you're using a writing mode RTL, and I'll show this in a Copen demo in a second, um, but it makes it so that it, you have to basically redo a lot of your CSS for your padding and your margins if it's the wrong, if it's not using the inline. The inline and the block will adjust to the browser's mode, basically. Simplifies. Yeah. Um, and I put the blue given here for any parents who have <laughs> young kids, because blue is awesome. Um, it's an agnostic terminology, so again, you don't have to worry about left, right, so it, it's, it's just a simple terminology that you can use across all these different um, styles. And like I said, it works the exact same way as non-logical properties. So if you start using logical properties, your future self will thank you because if you have to make changes later on, it's you don't have to go back and redo your work. So, show a little demo real quick. Oh boy, I have to blow this up a lot. Yeah, okay. I figured we'd have to do that. So, the, the left side uses regular non-logical properties. And this, this side uses the logical properties. So the styling is the exact same. But what happens is if you change if you change the direction of the text, for instance, from LTR to RTL, notice how your margin on the it flips. Like if your margin stays over here, but it flips if you change the side. That can cause, you know, all you're doing, you, you have to if you had a whole site built in one way with a sidebar, it would all change and your margins would be totally off. You have to go back and fix it. Or you have to basically duplicate your CSS to say, you know, for in direction RTL, then do it, you know, margin on the right. If it's, you know, a regular uh, LTR, then do margin on the left. Same thing also if you have, um, if you're working with Asian languages such as Japanese or some Chinese, I think. Um, if you, if it's the, that languages are written vertically sometimes. So again, this can mess up how things are read or read. More importantly, it's really just an, a, a way to make your code agnostic and flexible for any situation as opposed to having to worry about adjusting something later on for not even for yourself but also for other developers behind you so um, right, how do I get back to it I go back to arc yeah there you go and then sorry I'll go over here and click on Aubrey's using the fancy arc browser yeah. she got an invite there you go <laughs> I, can, I can send you can I, can I, no I, I'm kidding yeah. Yeah. all right where did the presentation go Hmm. What are you doing? There it is. Yeah, there it is. Now let me, uh, there we go. All right, perfect. <clears throat> All right, so that's it for logical properties. Um, and next up, quick question. yeah, yeah, no problem. So margin, you could just put margin 10 and put it on all four sides. Yeah, for, for, if for shorthands, the shorthands still work the exact same way. Um, if you're getting, if you have a code linter and it gets more specific, you would want to break it out to the block or inline, but otherwise, yeah, the shorthands still work fine. It's the same way. All right, so next up is container queries, which is something that I've been looking forward to for a long time, and I'm super happy that it's now finally supported everywhere. I think Firefox just got it in on February 14th, so uh, yeah, it's the 18th now. Yeah, yeah. last-minute update to slides. Yep, yep, exactly, <laughs> your uh, last-minute stuff. But yeah, um, container queries are, I think, going to replace media queries everywhere um, because it's a lot, it makes a lot more sense to use them. Um, so yeah, they're a way to isolate parts of the page and declare to the browser these parts that are independent from the rest of the page. Um, and the way you do them is you, uh, you define them with container type and container name properties. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and you need to have both of these. You need to have both of these for yeah. containers. Yeah. Um, so the first thing you define is the container type. There are really two different types. Um, size, which is based on the inline or the block, which um, Adam just went over with the logical properties. Or you could do inline size, which only does the width. I think for the most part, people are just using inline size because container queries are usually wanting more of the width of the um, width of the element. Um, and then you have to you. I don't think you necessarily need to have a container name, but it's really nice to have one so you can specify it later. So yeah. Anyway, here's some code example. Uh, let me know if I can make this bigger. That's here. a screenshot. Thing. No, can't make the screenshot bigger, so this is good. So this is an example of how you set up a container query. Um, as you can see, there's a lay the main container of layout container that has both the container type, the inline size, 
and it has the container name of desktop container. So pretty straightforward. And then you can see down here, um, there's the, you can define with using at container, and you have the name desktop container. And this is everything that's 768px or bigger is going to have a different width. Um, by default, the width is 33.33%, but when it's bigger, the width will be 50%. So like a media query, but yeah. there's more flexibility with it. Yep, yeah, it's just with the container and not on the view on the entire viewport. And here is a demo that... Ooh, yeah, that's and that's very important while she's on the demo. Yeah. So you're, you're not affecting the entire viewport, you're only affecting this element in that, the elements defined in that container. So you're not changing the whole page for responsive mm -hmm. design, you're just changing part of it for this scenario. So if you have a sidebar, for instance, that um, you want it to be a different width or something like that as, as, it, as the page gets wider without changing the whole width of the whole page. So you're, gonna, you're basically breaking out your responsive design yep. into, con into components, like containers, basically. Yeah, and this is an example um, with some pretty kitties. Um, and you can see when I resize the page here, Oops, that's not how I resize the page. This is how I resize the page. Um, you can see that as the page gets resized, this one on the left here um, will be coming a little more narrow. And um, oops, that's great. Uh, and oh, then, I'm sorry. yeah, yeah, no worries. And then the other one, when you make it bigger, it'll get wider. Like if I make it bigger here, maybe my thing is not big enough to do it. Oh, I mean, there we go. Um, yeah, so if this one on the right gets wider when you make it bigger, and the one on the left gets more narrow when you make it smaller. So we're not changing the structure of the page here, we're just changing the element of the page so it gets to a different size. And we'll have, we have links in all the slides to this so you can go ahead and mess and look at our, our bad code <laughs> yep. and play around with it. Um, yeah. Yep. This is weird that every time I go back to the slides, it turns into a black screen. That's good times. At least you can get back to it, that's all about it. Yeah. I just need to figure out how to get back to it. Escape. Right. Yeah, I've been doing that. Sorry about the technical difficulties. It's only because we're presenting live, that's why. Yeah, that's always how it goes, <laughs> yeah. All right, what's going on here? Where's the recirculate button? <laughs> why will it not work? Let's see. Sorry about this. I'm going to blame it on ARC. That's the thing. You have any ideas? What if you just go to it? <laughs> yeah, what if you just refresh? Yeah. Oh, refresh is right there. Yeah. Nope. Oh, it says well, it says waiting for Google. Oh, uh, is there? Are we running into Would some you know, have, Yeah. Oh. I don't think we got full signal. Wi-Fi fail. Who's downloading movies? Come on. <laughs> Stop streaming Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the other pages were loading. Yes. Maybe Google is down. What? The internet is gone. The internet is broken. <laughs> hey, note self. Save offline. So wait, switch to tab. Maybe just do it in a new browser. Yeah, I'm going to do it now. the slides. Yeah. Yeah, let's do uh, Firefox. I've got it open over there. Yeah, fire that up in there. <laughs> now I gotta log in. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, live coding. It's always fun. Has everyone enjoyed Drupal Camp? Mm -hmm. I flip through. What is oh. going on? Why can't I log into my Google account? Awesome. If the lights were moved under, it would be easier to see. Oh, yeah. Grab up your own lights. Ooh, it's dark in here now. All right, I don't know why my stuff is not working. Adam, we might be using your computer. All Sorry. right, well, uh, let's see, i got to find <clears throat> plug to get the HDMI. Yeah, it's right here. Adam, log in to Google. Or YouTube. Yeah, see, I can't. Oh, yeah, you can log in. To, yeah, but I have a super long password. I don't yeah, have, same. Uh, you don't know. It says I can't find my Google account. Is this your Lullabot one, or did you make what account did you make it under? It looks like a, your Lullabot It's my Lullabot account. account, yeah. Oh, I put the wrong email address in. Sorry, guys. We are all trained web professionals here. It's go. okay. Yeah, all right. Putting in the right email is what's important. All right. All right. Oh, my God, really? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I have to try another way because I don't have the Google thing. Uh, there. All right. Well, this is good times. 
right. It is important to back have two uh, two factor authentication where you can. Hey, we're back. All right. Hopefully this one doesn't mess up. All right. So where were we? We were in container queries. All right. So I think I had just gone over all of this. I think we had I had opened the code pen demo. And now we are done with container queries. Does anybody have any questions about container queries? Should we go over it to like, go over it again to uh, refresh your mind after the awesome technical <laughs> difficulties? Very good. All right, we'll have time for questions at the end, hopefully. Yeah. If yeah. nothing else breaks. Yep. <clears throat> anyway, so next up is the is selector, which um, is the best selector ever. Um, I really <laughs> like this one because it really simplifies code that I used to have to write like, <laughs> In, in a ton of different lines, and now you can just write it into one line. Um, so is, is it's like I just said, it's useful for simplifying to a single line. Um, it does this weird thing called, uh, called taking on the specificity of its most specific selector. And I have an example, no, I don't have an example in here, so that's oh, also well, great. I think it's on the demo, but yeah. Yeah. You can just explain. Yeah, I also have it's. It also accepts a forgiving selector list, and you can see that example right here, where if you have is a flat with a class of cats and then a fake pseudo selector of kittens, which is obviously invalid. Um, even though there's an invalid selector in this list, this will still work. It'll still just select cats, even if kittens is invalid. So that's really helpful, so that you're not running into weird debugging issues with your CSS if you wrote something wrong. So that's really nice. Um, one thing is does not do is it doesn't select pseudo elements, so you can't do is before and after. Um, so you'll have to do something different to actually be able to do that. So yeah, it's uh, pretty sweet. And here is my example um, where you know if you want to style all of your H elements inside main, you just have to do something like this. And now it is. You just say main, and then if it's if it is H1, H2, H3, H4, H5 you'll change the color that way. So that is way, way better than having like a ton of lines of code to better essentially doing the same thing. <clears throat> All right, it's CodePen. I'm not logged into CodePen, I think, in Firefox. <laughs> well, so. I think, but it's a demo, so I think it should be okay. Yeah, so this is my, I don't know why cat's not working either. I don't know what's going on. All right, anyway, so this is a, this is a, a little CodePen demonstrating the is selector. Um, what I'm doing here is all of the heading elements that are inside this thing here, um, inside the win HTML window here, I've set them all to be a color of some sort of blue uh, turquoise. Like your hair. Yep, like my hair. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did everything that is is main or a side. So the sidebar over here is an aside, and this is a main element. I decided to change everything to be turquoise because I like turquoise, obviously. But I also then wanted to, I want, I have one bit of special text that's in here that I wanted purple. I don't know why, but I wanted that special text to be purple because like that cat, that great cat that you can't see, I wanted that title to be purple. So that's just a little thing that you can do there to kind of override is and yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So this is an H2, but then if it's, <laughs> so like we're still, we're, hmm? we're selecting H2, yeah. 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 Sorry, I was yep. trying to explain to myself in my head. So yeah, no worries. <laughs> Yeah, so that is is, and yeah, oops, this is way better, okay. And then next up, similarly with is, there's also the where selector. Um, it's very, it's pretty much the same thing as is, but with one specific difference. And that difference is that where never has any specificity. It has zero specificity, and that can come in really useful if you're trying to like change an element to be a different color and um, you don't want to have to write like important or anything like that to make it super, super specific. And I've got an example here. Um, you can see here in this, um, you have an is and a where right next to each other. Everything that's in the is is gonna have a link color of hot pink. Everything in the where selector will have the color of Rebecca purple. But then wait, maybe I want to have the footer links be green instead. So the difference here between is and where is that in this code pen demo, um, you'll see that I have these two is and where's. And with is, since the specificity of the is selector has like a specificity, this footer A that I have defined down here, all the way down here, this yellow green, it will not get applied to the is selectors, but it will get applied to the where 
because the where has no specificity, so this footer A will win over the purple that I have in the where links. So that's like a good, that's a good use case for using where over is. I feel like is is probably used a little more than where, but it's good to have this like under your belt too when you need to do something like this. Any questions on is or where? What happens if where is competing against Shaman uh, import? Um, with important, since important has more specificity, that will, the important will win there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. You're up. Not. Where's that? Is it up now? I think it. I don't know where. That's fine. That was oh, after this. Okay, right. take a break. Do you break? Not, or not just another boring selector. So, not has been around for a while. You may or may not have used it. Uh, it's been supported since not IE9, um, but it's probably not supported by IE11 for some strange reason. Um, so, the selector argument list, yeah, it's not supported by IE. So, again, not in cats and kittens, easy written as not.cats and not.kittens, you have to chain together. IE wouldn't pick up the, the comment yep. to the selector list. Um, it does not accept forgetting selector lists like is and where, so it's not. Not, not as not going to it's be, nuts. be as, um, it's not going to be except invalid ones, basically, it won't work. So it doesn't have the same flexibility as is and where do. Yeah. Um, so, the most, ex the, probably the most common example you'll see with this is for like list items, like you have, you want, instead of your last child, but it's, you want to give all of your allies a certain um, margin at the bottom, and you want last child to be margin bottom, but then you don't want the and it's not last star child be margin bottom. So, like, here we go. Here's a fun list. Hey, it's, here's another. Here's another list. Here's an even more fun list. Why is it more fun? Because there's no margin at the bottom. So, what we did was, and is right here. You can see that if it's not the last child li element, it doesn't have a mar. It has a margin bottom. But this last one in this um, right-hand list, which is the list with not class. This has a, this has a margin bottom, but this one does not. So rather than doing, yeah, it basically gives you a way to filter things out. And you can chain nots and ises and wheres and all that sort of stuff together, and also hases when you get to that to make some gnarly looking CSS, but you can get some real specific things that are almost like, almost like an if statement in, with CSS, basically. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, something that will be coming, um, we wanted to do a little bit of a, a talk about this. This is kind of like a CSS thing that's coming. Um, there's something called margin trim that's coming down the road. I don't think it's, I think it's just a spec, a spec now. I don't even think people are working on it yet. But what it'll do is it'll add some um, logical properties to trim the margin from the bottom or the margin from the top, or I guess it would be margin from the inline or block or whatever. Um, so you'll be able to use that instead of using this uh, li not last child to actually get rid of the margin on the bottom or wherever. You so you know if you're if you're making a view and you don't want the last view to have a border bottom because it's the end of the page, yeah. you could you'll, with the margin trim or the padding. Yeah, margin trim you'll be able to trim that so it's shorter, um, make it easier as opposed to having to write this extra stuff. All right, time for some has, which is. I guess I said container queries was my favorite. I think has is actually my favorite. The only problem is it's not supported in Firefox. So you might run into some problems with some of my, my yeah, examples. Like using oh, Firefox yes, now. fun. OK. <laughs> yep. We can oh. open up it. We can just copy over to the Yeah, yeah, that's what I'll one. do. Yeah, so anyway, um, as most people know about has, um, it allows the ability to, to select an element's parent and actually like style that, depending on what the children are. And that has been something I have wanted in CSS for so long, and I'm so happy that it's everywhere but Firefox. Come on, Firefox. Stop working on the focus uh, mm -hmm. or the float on um, inline the yeah. logical properties and start working on has. Um, and uh, as you can see, like my little example here is if you do div has image, it'll select all the divs that have an image in it, which I feel like is a really common use case that most people are using when they're styling pages, especially home pages. Um, this one also takes on the specificity of its most specific selector, and that's a tongue twister right there to say. Um, as you can see here, um, if you have a div with a has and you're selecting an ID, that has a higher specificity than div has with just the image because of how specificity works. And I'm gonna do this. Here's my little code example um, where like, I have a grid item, there's some styles to it, 
but if the grid item has an image, I want the border to be a different color, I want to get rid of some padding, I want the overflow to be hidden because I just want the image to like uh, display correctly with this border radius grid item. So I'll open this up. You'll see what happens when I open this up in um, when I open this up in Firefox, which doesn't support has. You can see all three items. They all have the same border color and all of that, and it doesn't look very exciting. Also, no cat image, so that makes me sad. Yeah, go back to Arc. Hopefully, Arc decides to behave. You'll see that here there's an image. You'll, you can see here that has actually is getting applied where I had that same style that I talked about before where if the grid item has an image, I made the uh, border hot pink. I did a um, overflow hidden to get rid of the weird clipping thing that happens when you have an image with a border radius. And I got rid of all the padding because I wanted the image to actually like go all the way across in this little car here. And the cat shows up. Yeah, and the cat shows up because Firefox hates cats, apparently. Oh. I don't know why. <laughs> Sorry, were you done with that? Yeah, I'm done, yeah. Yep, and that's it with has. Does anybody <clears throat> have any questions about has? Could you, like, is, is has, like, it goes all the way down, or could you just say just, like, at the, you well, know, an immediate image under the div? So, yeah, so the question was, does it go all the way down, or does it, um, is it just the immediate image underneath the div? Um, it could go, it would go down to everything. I can, I can change it to be like has like the like greater than, greater than sign in it, IMG, and that, yeah. I would only do the first. The, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's, other, there's a lot of cool things you can do with has, but I just did a very basic example yeah. here. Yeah. You said it's coming to Firefox soon? Yep. I think it, it's Firefox just released um, 110. I think it's in, it's supposed to be 111 to 112, so the next yeah. couple, probably by next few months, it'll definitely yeah. be out. Uh, they, they surprise everybody by getting um, yeah, get container, container right? query yeah. in, like surprise on Valentine's Day. So, yeah. Happy Valentine's Day to us. Yep. All right, so at layer. So this one's going to take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I layer allows you to set styling no matter where it is in the CSS cascade. So it works with either agnostic, you can just call it at layer, or you can name it like at layer toolbar. Um, and it can be imported, and layers can also be imported from other files. Um, and this is supported in all browsers. So, uh, before I get into the demo, I kind of want to just explain a little bit if I can blow this up. Nope, nope. Yeah. Um, the way to kind of think about layer is the use the use cases for it because you're like, okay, so what's the why would I need to move stuff around in the in the cascade? Because CSS is one of the only languages that has the cascade is important for like where it is. The JavaScript, you can jump around, you can do other things. CSS, it has to stay that structure. But that's all implied basically on the assumption that everything has to flow that way. That's hard. That's, when you go into writing CSS, you have that assumption that's going to happen. But with, with um, layers, what you're doing is basically making layers inside of the cascade itself to stack them and move them where you want. So what you're doing is essentially like a use, like, or a use case would be like a reset file. So if you had a reset of things, you could create a layer of just the reset. And you could put that in your files wherever you want to by importing it, or you could have everything at the top. Um, you could use it to make basically one, I guess by the simplest way I could explain it is to make, if you're familiar with writing SAS, you can import a SAS file. You know, you write your mix-ins over here, you import that into all your files. With, with layer, you can do that, that this natively in CSS because you can import things from another file and you can import, say you have my files here, my, you know, my, my layers here, and you can import just from that one file, just a specific layer. And so you can call all this natively with CSS without any preprocessors. So you can structure it, and the way that the flow works, which I'll show in the Copen demo, is you try to define these at the top. Um, you know, it's best practice by put your, your layers at the top if need be. But the, the order of this, you're calling the layers, supersedes anything else in the cascade. So you can have secondary content here, but have it above here. So you would think it would cover over the main, it would override the main content. But it doesn't because in this listing, I've reordered inside the cascade itself how things are, are flowing. All right. Can we know, anybody have <laughs> any? Does that make sense so far? So, uh, like, if say I have like 50 CSS style sheets on my page that don't have aggregate aggregate CSS on or something, and I can't control the order, is this like to help that? Like, the yes. So the question is, is if you have a bunch of style sheets and you can't control the order, so you can't. <coughs> 
it, it's not going to control your order of the actual files themselves in the way the browser renders, but if you have everything in the style sheet, like if you're just importing a bunch of stuff to the style sheet, you can move them around as need be or import them only when needed because you can call things. I, I'll, I'll get into the code pen now because I think it's a little easier. Yeah, I was going to just fire it up for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, let me get to where I'm at. So, layers would be anonymous with no names, like I was saying. We're going to call them the name specifically. Um, the order declaration of layers determines the order in which they render in the precedence. So, below, basically right, right here, this I just find this order here, secondary content and main content. So, even though these are lower in the, even though main content is lower, in normal CSS, it would control the rend, you would control the render and anything in main content would be first or would get rendered you know, after secondary content. But because I'm controlling it with layers by restructuring it, they change. So um, like if I change this right now, oops, to yeah, reversing the two. main content, reverse it, now it's, it's reversed. So it's you know, red or purple. Be and even though, so that in that case, the, the, the cascade, how you have the information in the file matches what the um, document's rendering, but then if I reverse it, then it goes back to here. Um, layers could honestly be an entire talk <laughs> by yeah. itself. Um, like I said, the use cases are for cutting down on your code in the sense that like, if you have, for really complex CSS projects, things where you have a lot of different people working together, a lot of different elements, you're basically making like components that you can reuse and see it, like almost like a web component that you can use in CSS. So you can call those files directly without having any preprocessor needed. So you could say, you know, if Bob's working over here on the directory page and Sally's over here working on the events page, they can both call the same CSS file in their code without overriding each other and have it imported through the layers um, and then structure where they need it. Or you can have a main layer list of all the different elements on a page and then they can just pick and choose which layers they want to import into their file. So you're reusing the CSS without having to use any preprocessors, and it's it's useful for um, basically, like, like I said, large projects or just changing the order. <coughs> yeah, you, having more fine-grained control over your cascade, too, is really is a really good use case for layers as well. And getting to the question about important, the specificity also gets kind of crazy with layers. <laughs> important can reverse it yeah. if, you're, if you're using it inside of it. Like, normally the layer, like even if I was to put um, main content red, like you would think this is important, it's, gonna, it's going to um, supersede it. It does because it's, it's right here. So this, so this can break the cascade by putting important inside of it. So important still can reverse basically the layer order. So you still... See, I try to avoid using important in layers. Well, yeah, you it just breaks your brain because yeah. it's so weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I said, there's a lot we could really, really get into on layer. Does that all make sense? What I'm kind of kind of explaining? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, it's making a stupid question. No, it's but okay. Where are you getting layer secondary content? Is that a class or an ID? That's that's a, it's a layer name. It's, it's specific layer to name. this this here. So I'm calling the um, so I'm listing my layers. And like I said, you want to try to make your list of layers higher up in the in the document if you can. I mean, you can do it technically wherever. But this is the master list of what layers order render and which layers order in what order. So. Oh. So I'm. I, these are the. This is the list, and then I'm naming. The, I'm calling these in here, and where it gets even more interesting, because I is that you can get. You can also nest layers inside of each other, <laughs> so you can import a layer inside of another layer. Should have put an inception gif in here. Yeah. <laughs> so the layer names aren't actually defined in the HTML. No, you're setting it through this. You're setting it in your CSS document. Yes, you're setting the layer. This question was. You're setting. The layer names are not set in the HTML. They're, they're not classes. They're set through the CSS document. Um, Thank you. And then you can also use, I'm, I'm repeating your question just for the microphone, the oh, thing here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you can, and then you can call if, um, just parts of other layers as well. So, we're in, so you can nest layers inside of each other, but you can also um, call them with basically the outer name and then the inner name. So if I wanted to call sidebar inner, it would be um, oh, this may have been a typo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the those are the, you would, you can call the names like like that, and then you also make a separate file. Um, so you could do import, which is a CSS. That's about, that's been around CSS and HTML for a long time. But you can add this layer part at the end. So if I had a file called myThemeFile.css, 
and then I had a layer in it called the layer I want by name, all this, this would import just that one layer from that one file into your CSS file. So you could send, again, have your, have your reset and then say, okay, I just need a reset for mobile or I need a style for this block. And you can just call that one particular part of that one particular CSS file and import it directly in the layer function, as long as you define it as a layer in your CSS file. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel every time I think of layers. I'm like, all right. It's not. It's not an every. Stuff. Yeah, it's not an everyday use, but it does have gives CSS a lot more flexibility without having to have a pre process or any sort of weird JavaScript or anything else to make it work. Line clamp. This is my one of my all time favorite ones. <laughs> you may or may not have heard of it. Um, it used to be called. It still works technically as dash webkit dash line clamp. So, a line clamp is a way to trim amount of text without adjusting too much with, with, to have the browser trim the text for you. Um, like you would do, like in views, like you would do you know, maximum characters. You can trim by lines of text with line clamp. Um, it shortens text to a specified line limit with an ellipses at the end. Um, and line clamp also works. It's meant to replace WebKit line clamp. So originally this was a Chrome functionality feature, but then Firefox basically decided to, input, to support it. So you can, you can, this would actually just work fine in Firefox, even though it's WebKit, um, and Safari, and Chrome, and Edge, and everything else. Um, so, sorry, pick up. It's visually hidden, well, do I? Sorry. It's, vis it's pre still present, but visually hidden. So your text for accessibility would still show up, but it's just visually hidden for um, sighted users. And you can do it like a line clamp or um, WebKit line clamp. So, we really should not make these screenshots. Yeah. <laughs> so it says the um, the way it works is you have to have display WebKit box for the text, which is it's still basically a block element. Um, WebKit box orient vertical, and WebKit line clamp, and then your number of how many lines you want to show, and then you do overflow hidden. So you don't have to specify height, you don't have to do anything like that. You just do hidden to hide it, and this these four chunks of code will make you a nice box that. If it, the text goes past, it'll just give you little ellipses. So if you're making a long, um, you know. But so this is better for uh, uh, resizing to uh, your yes, it is better. device as opposed to say 180 characters or whatever. Yeah, it's useful for resizing for a device and also for, the question was, is it useful for, yeah, for responsive. Mm -hmm. So right here I've got the part of the, um, Gaysburg address, thank yeah. you. <laughs> and so I'm saying on the fourth, um, or sorry, the third paragraph, make these, make trim it down to three lines. Okay, so well, I want to make it down to five lines, and then I change that, and now I get five lines, but I still get my ellipses at the bottom, or I only want it to be, I just want to make all of the paragraphs have three lines. Oh, that's not going to work. Sorry. <laughs> Live coding. So it trims it, so this, this first paragraph is short enough, but then these are longer, so it just trims them all automatically. So you can use this for any browser, all mobile, everything, it works great to show different, to trim the text down. So again, if you have like a, <coughs> a view and you're outputting someone's biography and you don't want to trim the characters, you can just use line clamp to trim the characters down without having to go into views and adjust them to tie to Drupal. The things that we still want. All right, we've got five minutes, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've got to. We'll, we'll we're breeze gonna, through these. Yeah, we're going to pound through these. I think we're doing this one, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, um, we're and, and we can keep going. I mean, if you guys want to hang out till you know, if you're not hungry, <laughs> stick around. If you don't um, want tacos. Yeah. Yeah. These are things that are, thing, we say things we still want. These are things that are either in development or someone's come up with this brilliant idea and they should be, it should be in development or it's just a complete pipe dream for right now. So, um, text wrap balance. So this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. You have text wrap, um, you know, overflow and all that sort of stuff. What if we could just make the text go to the right amount of lines and then stop and do that each line is equal instead of some sort of weird, like this. So this is really long text and very uneven, but what if we just did it so they can all wrap evenly? Wouldn't that be great? That is actually sort of being worked on right now, but it's, it's, it's still a ways off. Maybe next year. Fingers crossed. And this was this is a big one that is implemented in most browsers, not most, but into, implemented in a couple of browsers, but not Chromium yet. Is subgrid? Yeah, no worries. I figured that was going to happen. <laughs> um, 
So subgrid is really nice um, as part of the grid specification. I kind of wish that subgrid had been released at the same time as grid because this is very useful for if you want all your items within a grid item to also be part of that same grid that it belongs to. And it might be confusing, but it's pretty easy to implement. Um, you just have to add a display grid to your grid item. And then for your grid template columns or rows, you just add the grid, you, you set it to be subgrid. Um, and that way, you'll be able to go ahead and align everything to the same grid. And yeah, you can just pop up. This is one that only works in Firefox, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is subgrid. Um, we have, since we're using Firefox now to show it, I have a support that's telling me that, yes, this browser supports subgrid. And you can see that these three grid items in here, everything is aligning no matter what the, um, no matter what the like, length of the text is. So you can see that the second card has a ton of text in the content, but they're lining up the same. And if you scroll down into the, uh, the HTML here, mm -hmm. you'll see that the links on the bottom here are also on the same grid, grid, grid plane or whatever that word is called, um, so that it doesn't look all funky. We can pop it up in, um, in Arc just so you can see. Which, by the way, Arc is a Chromium browser. for. Yeah, Arc is a Chromium browser, so this is like looking at it in Chrome. Um, and you can see here that they're not aligning correctly. You can see that none of the description text is aligned correctly. You can see the three links are kind of all over the place too. So when subgrid is finally um, supported in Chrome, you won't see this in Chromium browsers too. So it's just a nice way to make all your cards look nice and even and pretty. There's lots of stakeholders like that, so good thing to do. Is Arc open source? Probably not, um, yeah. Um, color contrast, so this is kind of a, a pie in the sky wish sort of thing, but it is sort of being worked on a little bit. It's a, it's a draft spec for the W3, um, W3C. So it compares two sets of colors that you give it to set a defined color. So, and what it does is it compares them for how well they contrast with each other. So with accessibility, you have to make sure you have a, a certain contrast level for people can read it. What this hopefully would do and there's no browser support yet, so I'm just gonna have to fake it, um, is use it so that you can make, so it would say, okay, let's do, we would compare these two colors, four, four, two, and then five, eight, and then against this color, so these would be the two colors, like you would provide two colors that you wanted to use, like which one would work better here? So this would be like a light and dark mode, and then it would compare against this color, and then the browser would pick the one that had the better contrast. So it would show automatically without having to go in manually and do all this checking for accessibility to make sure it would work. Um, and it would automatically set a color or background color property, for example, to how it would work. And this one's not anywhere, right? No, it's, it's, it's a thought, it's an idea, but it's not, not in yeah. browser yet. So who knows if it'll ever happen, but. Yeah. And yeah, last one. This is one that grinds my gears a lot, is why can't we write comments like this? How can we have to do them this way? Why do we have to have asterisks? Why? Yeah, why is there asterisks? Why can't I just do this? And we, I put a few other links to other places that are talking about CSS um, in the, in, I was going to say the blogosphere, but that's a super old term. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what people want in CSS in 2023. So especially this last link down here is a compilation of all these, um, all these blog posts. It's really interesting to see what people really want in CSS. We, we personally think that they saw the article that we wrote and they said, oh, why got to make an article like this that's, that's not as cool as Aubrey and Adams? Yeah, so, that's right. you know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then the other ones are, like, there's, there's cool new viewport units. Um, Line height units, yeah. Yeah, I touched on uh, margin trim. And then there's also style queries, which is instead of using um, a, min, a width inside to select container queries, you can use um, CSS custom properties to do that instead. Um, I can't remember where that is supported and if it's supported everywhere, but that's also a really cool thing to be able to do. Yeah. And Ta -da. that's it. Ta -da. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we'll put we'll, we'll put the slides, the whole presentation up on the on the um, website. It's, we'll do that soon. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Anybody? Yes. This is in regards to the layer that we discussed, the layer component. Yes. So, uh, the question is that when we talk about page optimization, I'm just giving a background information. Yeah. If we have too many CSS files, then the speed of the page becomes really slow, or it affects the load of the the, the loading speed of the website. So if we make use of layer 
Alright, so the question is, does using um, layer cut down on the amount of CSS loaded on a page? It, I guess the scenario is maybe. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with browser requests, but if you have, it, it might be a, a trade-off because if your homepage has loads, you know, homepage style.css, but your other site loads, you know, site style.css, if one file is smaller, it could just cut down on your size. So if you have all this homepage style and you're only loading that one style on that one page, then that would be, um, you wouldn't have to load all the other site styles. So you could use, yeah, you could use layers to import elements from different style things. Like you, you would, you have to, basically you have to make more individual CSS files, but those files could be, would, may end up being smaller per page than your overall, just having one main one for your whole site. Does that make sense? Because the browser is smart enough to only render what it's called on the page. <clears throat> but it would still, it's, it's not going to be, layer isn't going to necessarily solve network requests for things. It's just going to help. You can make the file smaller and also just reuse your code without having to use a preprocessor to like SAS to do that. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Go have tacos. They're great. Yeah.